Um, so uh, my name is John Katsudis. I am CEO of a startup uh, called Influid Energy. Um, I had this all planned out, and then I wound up getting a video that was prepared by my program managers. And rather than let me explain to you what it is I'm doing, uh, I'm going to roll a three-minute video that does a much better job at explaining what it is I'm doing. But I want to say before I start to sort of lay out the tenor of all of this is everyone in this room that is getting their PhD, even you know from bachelor's to PhD as physicists, I don't think any of you actually realize how much power you have. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you guys the perfect job for you. What I encourage you to do, if I do anything, is to break the mold of your own self-perception of who you are and go after what it is you want to do. Society will absolutely support you, no matter what it is, because you do have something that is immensely special, and the world needs it. We are fighting wars right now over oil. The next wars will be over food. The next wars will be over land. It was physicists that came together that stopped the last horrible war. You can prevent the future ones. It is thrilling to see electric vehicles finally getting a foothold in commercial markets. But because this EV revolution is driven primarily by lithium batteries, it is difficult for the Department of Defense to electrify military vehicles. I'll share with you three DOD mission needs where lithium batteries currently fall short, readiness, resupply, and safety. In forward operating areas, we maintain a state of constant readiness. When a vehicle is out of power, we need to be able to refuel in 15 minutes or less. We operate all over the world, including places where there is no power grid. So we bring with us all of the energy we need to power our vehicles and our generators. We've all seen the dramatic pictures of electric vehicles on fire. This is dangerous at home, but it is more dangerous when you're being shot at. We could better meet each of these DOD mission needs if we had an inherently safe, high energy dense liquid battery that we could resupply and pump by gasoline. This is why the research that we've been funding with Influent Energy is so exciting. Flow battery technology has been around since at least the 1960s and are well known for their safety, practically unlimited cycle life, and low cost. But because liquids cannot hold as much energy as solids, typical flow batteries are not energy dense and are too big for electric vehicles. Influent's innovation is that they are introducing a solid liquid hybrid material using solid nanoparticles stably suspended in liquid electrolyte. This nanoelectric fuel has the high energy storage capacity of solids in a pumpable liquid format, dramatically shrinking the size of the flow battery to something we can put in an electric vehicle. With this high energy dense liquid battery, we can quickly refuel and resupply using the same model we do today by trucking in the nanoelectric fuel to forward operating areas. One of the most exciting properties of this novel fuel is that it is inherently safe. Not only will it not burn, but the aqueous electrolyte will actually put fire out. The potential commercial applications for this technology should not be understated. Imagine driving your personal electric vehicle to a refueling station, pumping the old battery out, and refueling with a new fully charged battery and driving off in five minutes, not five hours. The infrastructure for both supply and distribution already in place for gasoline could be repurposed. And since the battery is never consumed, sustainment supply chains are nearly eliminated. This technology is the first I've seen that could lead to a truly sustainable, well-to-wheel energy solution. Without DARPA's continued support to maintain our efforts, it would be impossible to move the needle on a much needed disruption to the status quo in energy storage research and development. And only through the SBIR program can out-of-the-box thinking and concepts come to fruition. The SBIR program exists to de-risk blue sky projects 
has a long history of doing so and is critical to our continued success. This is who we are. Um, it's been a really long trip to get here. All right. <clears throat> Lena Timofeeva is the Michelangelo. She is the world expert in uh, nanofluids. I was a beam line scientist for 17 years. I left to start this company. My team is extremely loyal because we all believe we are going to change this world. Carlos Segre is my CTO, and Alex is my biz dev guy. There's 11 people in my company. We move as a unit. We move in a unit because we believe in our work. And you can tell how passionate I am about this. But this is where we started. 2009, we were doing basic science of nanofluids. And I'll explain the concept in greater detail. But when we started this, we were not doing this because we were envisioning a liquid battery for transportation. We were investigating an entirely new format of matter that we discovered. It's ours. We were the first to do it. We're the named inventors on our patents. I'm on three different patents collectively. We have nine. We have over 300 publications. I don't know how many publications I've got. And the truth is, I don't care. All I care about is trying to change the trajectory that we're on right now. We are using nanoparticles in a way that have never been done before. We are suspending high energy density battery materials in a liquid electrolyte that has a very low viscosity. When you have a liquid battery, you can treat it like a fuel. So from now on, we're going to envision this as being a rechargeable electric fuel. This is how it works. The nanoparticles are suspended in the fluid and they're pumped through a porous electrode. When the uh, nanoparticles hit the electrode, on the cathode side and the anode side, there's a path for the electron to go through a load. There's a membrane separating them. The ions go across. That is not new. Flow batteries have been around for over 100 years. The first one was 100 years ago. But what is different about what we have done is by taking the high energy density batteries that actually push vehicles or can push vehicles, you can take low energy density battery formats and use the other high energy density fluids that we are making in that format. We're not reinventing the wheel on this. But the bigger picture on this is when you have a fluid you can create a closed loop energy cycle. Closed loop energy cycle is where you begin to use the roads, the pipelines, the regular fuel distribution routes as an alternate grid because the fluid itself is charged. So from the 50,000 foot view, you don't run into all of the bottlenecks that happen with deep market penetration in the electrification of transportation. If you electrified every single car on the road right now, you would melt the grid. Right now, there's only 2% market penetration of electric vehicles. There's value to the DOD, and they support our work. But there's value to NASA, and they support our work. And there's value to the Air Force, and they support our work. But collectively, what works for them will work for the world. This is where your heads need to be from my perspective. This is the power that you all, all have. This is what you should be thinking about. You should be creating your own paths for what you are passionate about. This is how the world changes. And there's not a lot of people like you out there. So you can follow traditional paths. Or 
you can create your own. And I suggest you do so, because it's lovely. This is where we started. <laughs> um, what you're looking at here, we were forced to, uh, to go through uh, NSF, National Science Foundation, sent us to go through uh, business boot camp. I hate business boot camp. You all will hate business boot camp if you ever have to experience it because it is so uncomfortable, almost as uncomfortable as it is for me right now to talk about this, because I actually have a little bit of a fear of talking in public. So what I'm pointing out here is back in 2014, we knew exactly the vision we were going after. What I suggest to you is pick where you want to be, where that target is, and then walk it back to where you are now, and then move forward. What you're looking at is we were forced, and we weren't very good at this. We're pretty good at it now. What we were forced to do is we were forced to take our technology and envision it into something that could actually be distributed, commodified, and become valuable first to the business world. That's sort of where it started. And once you did that, you expanded out to the value to society. Because now you can build sort of a foundational base to have conversations with. But I got news for you. When you do that, when you finally get there, then your business model no matter, does no, no longer matter. They will support you. Right now, what you're looking at is a, a, a picture of how we see the closed loop energy cycle. And each of our sponsors are funding our designs. NASA is funding the build out of a rapid recharger of the fluid. Air Force is paying for the rapid refueler. The NSF gave us our first bit of money back in 2015, 2016. I can't remember. It was for building the first cell. DARPA took that and said, we want you to build the first stack, the world's first nanofluid stack made of high energy density battery materials. So DARPA is paying us now to make the first mules for mobility devices. The bad news is if you guys are working for institutions and you come up with an idea that you are very, very passionate about, at a certain point, you're going to run into what we learned was a conflict of interest. You will have to make a decision at some point to break from the institutions, and it is scary to do that. It is safe to be in your institutions. It is safe to work in the national labs, and they are gems. The, national, the US national lab structure is it's the creme de la creme. You can achieve so much there. I was a beamline scientist for 17 years for Illinois Tech. I built and designed X-ray beamlines to do XAFs analysis at the advanced photon source. Elena, the CTO of my company, nine years at Argonne National Labs as principal electrochemist. Carlo, 35 years, physics professor at Illinois Tech. But we believe and our work because we created it, but we had to leave. The good news is if you have a master's or PhD, when you jump ship, you can teach wherever you want. You can gig work. The uh, community colleges, you can always go to pay those bills. And for a long time, Elena was teaching every single chemistry course she could at every single junior college that she could until we could get that first NSF grant. And from that first NSF grant, we have secured over $12 million on this work. As I said, I have 11 employees now, but at one point, it was just me, Elena, and Carlo. How to get funding. This is critical for you. 
funding is broken up. And, and this is how we visualize it. And, and we actually have a chapter that was published uh, in um, Wiley, uh, Chemistry Entrepreneurship. So you get sort of baby steps, non-dilutive funding. This is where you're not giving up equity for the company, for the money. And you get it, the, the first bit of money you get because you know how to write grants. You get mentoring, you come up with the business strategies, that's why I showed you that, that map, that first 2014 map. All of this has to go in there. And guess what's gonna happen when you write your first grant? It will get rejected. I suggest you drink heavily when you read the comments. <laughs> but when you sober up, read them again. That is your roadmap for the resubmission. And that will get rejected again. Drink again. <laughs> we didn't get our first NSF grant until three times. The comments, I hate criticism. But it's so critical. And you got to take it. Because they're right. And that's what's painful. Because you love to do something so much. And then someone says, eh, whatever. You try to tease out the little diamonds in the rough from those comments. You absorb them. You understand where the other people that are looking at this for the first time see where you're flawed. Correct that. Incorporate it. Learn from it. Then, Oh, the business co plan competitions. This, for me, is, it's like a, a poodles jumping through flaming hoops in front of rich people. But you have to do it, because every one of these is a step further. Every one of the challenges that you're going to run into revolves around some new form of criticism, failure, and then success. Then you start making it up to the bigger the bigger ideas, the, the, the okay, you get into what's called the, the SIBRs, S-B-I-Rs, Small Business Innovation Research Grants. These are competitive grants. You get into a phase two, generally those are about a million, million and a half. If you do well and always transparent and always honest with your program managers, they don't expect you to succeed when they give you the money, they expect you to be honest about why you failed so you can plan how you correct that failure. And they will support you. You are physicists. You are the only people that can solve the world's problems from my perspective. Believe it. Then you start getting Alternative revenue sources. These are sole source contracts. This is what NASA did for us. They gave us a sole source, gave us, again, wrong word. It was walking through fire to get there. You get a sole source contract, you build the device. You predict what the device will do. Then you analyze it. As long as you're absolutely transparent with program managers about where you are every single month and don't hold back, they will support you. This is what the government does. This is, this is what your taxpayers go to. This is how ideas start from very, very small concepts into much, much bigger effects. So where are we now? We're at the point where we're starting to raise the VC funds. This is where you got to give up equity. And the reason you have to do this, and this is an, it's, you can't avoid it, is eventually you need to get money to run the business. If you're doing the research, you can't also do the accounting. Every single one of the contracts that comes through is another report. Well, if you have five contracts at the same time, that means every month you are writing five reports, having five meetings on those reports. Now you're not doing the research. Now your creativity is being taken away from administration. 
This is where VC funds come in. Do not take them early. Do not give up any equity of your creation until it is absolutely necessary. It's a later game after you're done jumping through the flaming hoops. This is what honesty looks like. What you're looking at is our battery's current density performance over time. And you'll notice, and now I need the pointer. Ugh. I'm not as young as I look. Right here, you see this performance curve right here. Right here is where we got dumped by NASA. Two months later, we were around here. We started hitting this curve up. We are the weirdest success story for NASA. We were part of what was called a CAS project, Convergent Aeronautical Solutions, or Systems, yes. And um, we weren't getting the performance that we were supposed to get, but we knew we were getting close. So they wound up ramping us down. But two months later, we got the performance that we said we, we should get. And so NASA Armstrong off-ramped us and then gave us another sole source contract to keep moving forward. So even in failure, when you think you have just been cut, they care. They will support your creativity. Sometimes it really does come down to the wire, but you gotta push through. It's the only way this works. Oh, and every one of these dollars, and this is, I like to point this out, sort of coincides with an improvement in performance. And they're all from our, our, all of our sponsors, it's not just one. The critical skills that we need to do what we do you need to learn how to write proposals. There's no way around it. Absolutely believe in your vision unquestioned. You are going to be rejected. You have to accept that. Every day you are troubleshooting. Every day you need to grow into a better person. And Tap into your network. You all are so close to the most cutting edge concepts and ideas amongst you and your PhD peers, not your professors. You are on the wave, you are on the cutting edge. Get together, get together, bring your ideas together, form your companies, fail, get back up, do it again and again. There is nobody that knows science right now better than you. You are positioned to make the move. Take advantage of it. This is how you bring together three different projects under one vision. As I said, we have DARPA, we have NASA, we have Air Force. With a closed loop energy cycle, you begin to use the same methodology and use the same user experiences as you do gasoline. But in order to do that, you need to make every single piece of that loop. You're never gonna get anyone to pay for the whole thing. But if you're strategic about how you develop your technology, you can find people to pay for little pieces of it and build it all at the same time. This is my team, I love these guys. They've been there from the beginning. This is our labs, we got two of them. That's Big Bertha in the, right there, 500 liter reactor. We are not doing this at bench scale. At the same time that we are building the battery and the systems and the mobility devices, we are also building out the technology for scaling this. The only reason we're using 500 liter reactors is because it's the only thing I could fit through the door. I had to take an angle grinder of that thing to get it through. Don't stop the vision. 
Dream huge and go after it. It's all small steps, but it's all small steps that start from where your vision is and mapping it back to where you are now and then move forward. Thank you. Wow, what a great talk. I feel like there's so much more energy now. <laughs> um, so yeah, if you have questions, just, just come to the microphones. I, I think there was a, a gentleman in the back first. Go ahead. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for the talk, interesting. So I have like two questions. That's fine. Like um, if you are a professor or you are working in a research laboratory, you spend time doing a number of projects. Yes. Very exciting projects. On the other hand, when you do a company, just focus on one thing, right? So the question is exactly ah, that. No, no, no. I do not agree with that. No, no that's what you, I want you to explain. The, the question is, well, <clears throat> you, how much time do you spend in administration now in your new job? And what, and in, what about the research you are doing? Like, how, how is it different from what you were doing? Uh, I, we, my team, lives, eats, and dreams, all of this. So when you say how much administration is there, there's a lot, especially as you grow, okay? But if you dig deep, I can't really tell you a percentage. You just do the work, get it done. You know what your deadlines are, okay? So you gotta stay up late, but you do it because you love it, because it means something, because the world needs it, it drives you. We're driven. That's my answer. And the other, the first part, like you were doing like many projects when you were doing research and now you're focusing on one? Ah, the story. Okay. So I was a beamline scientist for 17 years. I did a ton of work with other groups, right? Um, when you're a beamline scientist, your job is to make sure the beamline works. And then groups just come to use your beam lines. Your job is to get them the data that they need with the highest fidelity possible. But when you gain that skill, well, guess what you get to do when no one's looking? You get to test your own ideas. And that's how I did it. And I did it with my peers. I didn't do it, I didn't. The beautiful thing about the position I had was as long as the research groups that were coming in to use the beam lines could use them and they, they worked bulletproof, we would be able to use for our own professional development, for our own ideas. And so I had my core people that I'm telling you that you all have to, to test our ideas, to, to make those little experiments. Did the electron go in? Did the electron not go in? And if it didn't, why didn't it? And there's your papers, right? You can publish all those papers that, 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 that the previous um, uh, speakers were, were saying are, are extremely valuable for your development, but you can do it with a cause. Yeah, this failed. This is why we think it failed. Paper number one. Okay, it worked. This is why it worked. Reference paper number one. Okay, now I've got a second paper. You see, build that up. Then you have this credibility, but who's the credibility? Who's your group? What's well, the people you trust? It's the people you worked with. That's how we did it. All right, thank you very much. No problem. Awesome. Uh, I'll have a, a what, very quick question from the check. Are you hiring? <laughs> yes, I have to expand. Okay, so I encourage everybody looking for a job. Inspired by the talk, that's the risk of agreeing to this. Thanks. It's okay. <laughs> to contact the speaker. Um, yep. two, two quick technical questions. How many times can you recharge the particles? <laughs> okay. So right now, we cycle uh, over 500 times because we have deadlines. Uh, the flow battery format in general does not suffer the same failure mechanizations as regular like solid format batteries. Flow batteries generally can go like 10,000 cycles. However, I got deadlines. 500 is good enough. 
we have absolute confidence we can hit 1,000 to 2,000, but suspect that we can go way, way higher than that. Thank you. And can you imagine having recharge in place instead of transporting this stuff? Yeah, no, it's still a battery. So if you wanted, you don't have to do the fuel swap. If you wanted, you still could pop, plug it in. It's a battery, so you still can recharge it in the car. The difference is this. I'm going to give you the problem. Right now, gasoline takes three minutes to refuel, let's just say, okay? You will never see fast chargers going above 20 minutes. If you did, it is a bomb, okay? <clears throat> You see where I'm going with this? Yeah, that actually wasn't my question. Can oh. you imagine the gas station being a recharging location oh, yeah. for Wait. the bulk fuel? Yes, yes, let me go back. Sorry. Because I saw a lot of transportation in there. Right here, that's the gas station. Right. That's the rapid refueler, that's the tanks. You basically pull the gas pumps out and put those in its place, that has NASA's charger on the back end of it to rapidly recharge it. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not sure you actually answered my question. I, I guess I don't understand it. I apologize. So you're, you're collecting this fuel to be recharged, and you talked about tanking it and moving it and transporting it. Ah, yeah, yeah. Could you simply recharge it in a central unit at that gas station and not yes. all the transit? Yes. And, but and how big a pipe do you need coming in there of uh, uh, kilowatt hours? Yes. So the the ability to charge it at the gas station is sort of an accepted, yes, we can do that. It's a battery. But the problem that we see is as you get to wider adoption of the electrification of transportation, the stress on the grid would begin limiting the grid's ability to charge at every location. So therefore, to, to, to reduce that drag, you have an alternate method for transporting the electrical energy storage. And so it's, it, it's in addition to the grid. And then you'll, you'll find a balance. And that's the thought process. Thank you. Yeah. And sorry, I, 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 I misunderstood your question. Next question. Um, so I know you mentioned this a little bit, but I guess like being an entrepreneur, especially in the startup phase, is hard financially. How do you make that work? Like if you have a family, um, I got a, I got a two year old girl. Right. Hey. It's hard. <laughs> I I mean, guys, solving big problems is not easy. But passion and the belief in yourself and your team can make you do things that that you go beyond what you can expect yourself to do. That's why I started with the first thing you have to do is you have to break the mold of the self-perception of yourself and then just do it. All right, thanks. No problem. That's a awesome takeaway. So I don't think we can top that with anything. So I have to cut the questions now. OK. <laughs> well, well, I actually have two more minutes. So I, I tried to keep speaker. it quick because I want to answer all of your questions. OK, so OK, one, one last quick question is, uh, so I guess the question is, um, oh, I lost it. Um, so I lost it somewhere here. Uh, but I guess the question was, uh, do you have any advice for people who are doing PhD, but they, they're international and they have a bunch of restrictions? And so let's say if they want to apply for a company like yours, right. what do you do with this government? Because, of, because OK, so because of the nature of my funding from, from uh, DOD, um, there, there are certainly we have to hire US citizens. But there are other agencies where requirements are not. And you just have to go towards those. Like, like who? Um, well, NSF generally doesn't have US restrictions. Um, uh, the other thing is, is partner with, I mean, if there are, you, this is where your network comes in, OK? Make sure your network has sort of a, a spread of talent where they can address those issues within the structure of the team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Let's give another round of applause for our speaker. Thank you.